Today on BRS TV we continue our aquarium filtration series with an episode focused on chemical filtration. Chemical filtration generally revolves around using some type of filtration media to remove particular elements from the tank. This can range from ammonia to carbon dioxide, but the more popular medias are designed to remove phosphate and dissolved organics. In today's episode, we'll try to cover some of the more popular medias. Rather than talk about the particular brands, we'll try and focus on the raw materials commonly used and their unique benefits. We'll also try to provide some information on how to use each product. Activated carbon is primarily used to remove the buildup of organic compounds that happens in virtually every aquarium. This buildup is almost entirely the result of byproducts produced from the continual breakdown of the foods and other products added to the tank. These elements will yellow the water, irritate corals, and can add unwanted odors to the room. Some of you might be thinking that your tank isn't yellow. But if you aren't using carbon, it almost certainly is. It's just not apparent because you're used to looking at it this way. The quickest way to tell for sure is to get two white five gallon buckets, fill one with RODI water and one with water from your tank. A vast majority of reefers will find the water to be much more yellow than they thought. The yellow pigments are not only undesirable from a visual standpoint, but they also significantly reduce light penetration. Most of us spent a ton of time researching the best lighting option and often spent a fortune getting the right one for our needs. One of the easiest ways to get the most out of that purchase is to use a few dollars worth of carbon a month and keep the water crystal clear. Activated carbon has an incredibly porous structure capable of removing these compounds through direct absorption like a sponge but the primary method is through adsorption where the molecules chemically bond with the surface of the carbon's pore network. This pore network has a vast amount of surface area. A single teaspoon of carbon can have the same surface area as a football field. This network of pores is created by taking common substances like coal, peat, wood, or even coconut and opening that network with heat and steam often heating the material to over 2,000 degrees in a low oxygen environment. This process can increase the surface area from 10 square meters per gram of material to well over 1,000. When selecting an aquarium carbon, we're looking for the following features. A wide range of pore sizes with a heavy emphasis on the large pores, and an easy to use product with low extractables. While they all look similar at the surface, there are some fairly major differences. Most of it revolves around the source material and the following basic properties of those materials. Carbon produced using bituminous coal is the least expensive and probably the most common aquarium carbon available. It typically has minimal dust and comes in large sizes that works well with most equipment made for aquariums. However, a majority of the pores are known as micropores, which are fairly small and not ideal for absorbing large organic compounds we commonly want to remove from the aquarium. This means you'll have to use larger volumes of bituminous carbon to achieve the same results as some of the other options. Carbon produced using lignite coal has a slightly higher cost and considered a highly effective macroporous carbon. The large pore structure works particularly well at removing large complex organic compounds, which means that even though it costs more, you can use significantly less material, which typically makes it less expensive overall. Lignite is a softer form of carbon, which means it may have more dusty fines and take a bit longer to rinse, which some reefers may find undesirable. Flushing the fines out in a reactor is so easy most people probably wouldn't notice, but by hand in a filter sock, it can take a couple of minutes, which may seem like an eternity if you're used to 20 seconds. It's available in large, easy-to-use granules, as well as smaller sizes, which are more efficient but most common aquarium equipment may have trouble holding the smallest of the particles in place. Lastly, there are specialty carbons, which are more expensive, but feature performance and usability benefits many reefers find valuable. An example of this is the ROX 0.8, which is a proprietary blend of different carbons, which include common coal-based carbons, as well as some materials like peat. This blend is powdered and then extruded into tiny pellets. 
This process results in a really hard carbon that rinses in seconds and covers an extremely wide range of pore sizes, which makes it effective on a wide range of common aquarium contaminants, especially those large organic compounds. The smaller size pellets are designed specifically to work well with fluids. While they are smaller in size, they're uniform in shape and size, so they're easier to use than small granular carbon. Lastly, the ROX 0.8 is designed for ultra-pure water applications like pharmaceuticals, which means it also has ultra-low extractables as well. An effect that's further compounded by the fact that you can use much less carbon and achieve the same results. There are a variety of ways to use carbon in the aquarium. The first one is a simple filter sock. Add your carbon and throw it into a high flow area of the tank. While this isn't the best method, it certainly is a cheap, easy way to incorporate activated carbon. If you are going to use a bag like this, you should probably double the amount of carbon you're going to use to get decent results. Once you decide on how much to use, add it to your bag and rinse out the fines. While best practices might suggest that you should use RODI water, it's much easier to rinse it in the sink with tap water and what I'd guess most people do. Make sure to just let the water flow through the carbon until the water runs clear. Carbon is a fairly soft material, so we don't want to wash or grind the particles back and forth, which would just create more fines. When the water does run clear, go ahead and drop it in a high flow area of the sump. It's more common these days to run carbon in a media reactor where we can be sure that 99.9% .9 of the total system water volume is cycling through the carbon several times a day. This is much more effective and allows you to use less material with better results. Rinsing carbon in a reactor is super easy as well. All you need to do is turn it on and let the water flush all the fines out for you. This is basically the only way I personally run carbon on standard size tanks. And reactors have become so affordable these days, they really end up paying for themselves to reduce media consumption. If you do decide to run your carbon in a reactor, you should note that many reactors are designed to tumble media. We advise against tumbling the carbon because the media is fairly soft. It can grind itself into dust, which will ultimately end up in the tank, along with the organics that it absorbed. Many reactors include a sponge, which you can use to hold the carbon in place and prevent tumbling. We suggest that you use it. There's a lot of different advice on how often to change your carbon and different claims made by manufacturers. Our advice is to use small amounts and change it out more frequently. I typically change it out when I do my water changes every couple weeks. It has been our experience that most carbon's effectiveness is drastically depleted in just a couple days of use. It's not that the pore network has been completely exhausted in that time, but more so that the large volume of organics in an aquarium and the quick formation of a bacterial slime coat will drastically reduce the availability of the carbon's internal pore network. That's not to say that it's useless after just a couple of days. It's just that this period is where it's going to have a vast majority of its effectiveness. Some brands of carbons claim to be effective for pretty long periods of time, but I think that's more or less just marketing. There isn't a lot you can do to prevent the external pore network from clogging with that bacterial slime coat or the large volume of organics in the aquarium. Another really common set of chemical medias is those used for phosphate removal. Phosphate is an essential component of most algae growth, so it's possible to significantly reduce the volume of algae growth by limiting the amount of available phosphate in the tank. Phosphate also slows coral growth by inhibiting the calcification process within the coral's tissue. This is also known as poisoning the surface of the aragonite crystal, which makes it difficult for the coral to lay down additional calcium and carbonate ions. In short, Maintaining ultra-low phosphate levels absolutely will result in faster stony coral growth, which is something almost everyone desires. There are a variety of different medias out there, but most of them are forms of aluminum or iron-based binders. The aluminum versions have been around longer, but it seems most of the industry has gravitated to the iron-based versions, commonly referred to as GFO or granular ferric oxide. GFO comes in a variety of forms, including granules, high-capacity granules, dry, and wet. They're all similar compounds and function in a similar manner. It's been our experience that the dry versions are the most cost-effective in terms of phosphate capacity versus dollar spent. They're also typically a bit larger particles and easier to contain. 
The high capacity granules have almost twice the capacity by volume, which allows users with large tanks to raise the effectiveness without increasing the size of their equipment. The HC granules also have the advantage of being much harder, so they tend to release fewer dusty finds and stand up to the constant abrasion from tumbling better. Some reefers will use GFO in a media bag, but to be honest, while it will reduce phosphate levels, it's unlikely to achieve the ultra-low levels most people are looking for. GFO is almost always tumbled in a reactor like this one. The primary reason we tumble GFO is to prevent the particles from adhering to each other and forming a solid rock. And you will want to flush the fines out of the GFO the same way we do with carbon. It's pretty hard to provide accurate advice on how much GFO to use because it's largely a component of how much phosphate you add to the tank via foods and other products, which is drastically different from one tank to the next. One person can easily add 10 times the phosphate as another by selecting different types, frequencies, and volumes of food added to the tank. For that reason, I would make a self-assessment about where you fall on this scale and apply that to the manufacturer's recommendations. GFO can maintain its effectiveness in a reef tank for a fairly long time, meaning weeks to months, but for the same reasons I just mentioned, any advice given on how long it will last for you is difficult. There are two basic ways to go about finding how long it lasts. The first, of course, is testing. Test occasionally, and soon as the phosphate levels start to rise, it's time to change the media. There are a lot of phosphate test kits out there, but to be honest, I find most of them fairly difficult to read. In this case, I strongly recommend the HANA checkers, which have a digital readout. If you don't want to test, you can try to pay close attention to the tank. When you see additional algae growth or the glass is getting green faster, it's probably time to change the media. Next time, change it a bit sooner. The idea is to adjust and preempt the algae growth. If the amount that you feed is fairly stable, you should be able to get a general idea of when to change it after a few of these cycles. It's also fairly common to mix GFO and carbon together with a ratio of around one-third GFO and two-thirds carbon. This mix keeps the GFO particles separated from each other by the carbon, so they won't adhere to each other. GFO is harder than the carbon, so we don't want to tumble the medias. We suggest using the sponge material to hold it in place, same as using carbon alone. That wraps up today's episode. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes come out, subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit BulkReefSupply.com and subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you for watching BRS TV.